Well, thanks very much. Um, let's see. Can, you be, can people hear me? Not really. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Wow. Is it okay? Yeah. I think it's okay. Um, right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some trends we see in experimental science um, and a model we've talked about at Berkeley Lab called the Super Facility. But I also will talk about some programming model issues and why I see languages like Julia as being really important as a piece of uh, this this kind of future view of experimental science. So a few years ago, when uh, big data was all the rage, that was kind of before it reached its peak. Um, we started talking at the lab about um, you know what it means for science, and of course we know what it means for the rest of you know, the commercial world, it means it, it, big data tells us what we should buy, um, or at least it tries to encourage us to buy certain things, like by putting uh, beer near diapers. Um, it tells us how to manage sports teams, what kind of a team you should put together, and it t tells us how to uh, manage our, our agriculture. So what about science? Um, well, what we realized in um, when you looked at science was that um, really what was happening there is large experimental uh, facilities, such as telescopes, were um, bringing data. I know you've already heard about um, some of those in the previous a couple of keynotes. But um, the, the other thing that we realized in going around Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and talking to the science groups across multiple areas is they often wanted to combine um, data analysis on these experiments with simulations. So in the case of cosmology, for example, you may be trying to understand what's going on behind the Milky Way galaxy where you can't directly observe that because it's too bright um, behind, you know, in front of it. Um, and so you'll use simulations for the parts that you can see and then try to interpret using the simulations what you, the things that you cannot see. So often in science, we're not happy just analyzing data. Um, we don't want to just get, say, drop some data into a deep learning network and out pops an answer because the next question is why is that true? And so the models and the simulations that we use to try to interpret the data are equally important. Um, this is also uh, interesting and, and important in looking at things like climate change and the environment. Um, and in this case, it actually is quite complicated because you're trying to put together biological data. So genomic samples, for example, that you would pick up in an in a region um, with climate. You're trying to understand will those genomes, um, will those com microbial communities absorb carbon or release carbon if the temperature warms by two degrees or, or things like that. So you actually want to put the climate models together with the, the uh, genomic analysis or in this case metagenomic analysis because they're in these large complex biological communities um, in order to understand uh, the interplay between, between those two things. And something like materials modeling, uh, we have a large facility up at the lab. If you've never been there, there's a big dome on the top of the hills that is the advanced light source. So this is a um, large synchrotron facility. Um, we, we use it to look at very tiny samples, um, things like, such as proteins or other, other uh, you know, materials and uh, chemistry, uh, biology, and things like that. And, um, but we also have a project there called the Materials Project, which is a massive high throughput simulation project. And you use the Materials Project to design particular materials that you want for things like batteries. Um, you have massive data sets that you want to be able to interpret, um, but you also want to then combine them with the, um, the data that's in the beam line to interpret the data, the observational. So ex example that we uh, ran recently, a few years ago actually, um, was looking at one of the beam lines produces data that it comes out in a, um, is an x-ray scattering beam, and th these images Images that come out of it, to me, as a, somebody outside the field, look like just complete, you know, white noise. Um, there's some kind of pretty, pretty patterns in it, but you really can't, I can't tell what it means. So what they do is they run simulations and say, if you shoot this x-ray beam at this material in a simulation, what pattern will it produce? And use that then to uh, interpret the data that you're seeing in an observation. Um, in the Office of Science part of DOE, so DOE has many large programs. One of them is Office of Science that looks at fundamental science questions such as those that I've just talked about. Um, there's also an applied part of the Department of Energy that looks at things like the power grid, uh, transportation systems, really trying to understand energy in kind of the real world and how that affects things. And in here, I think there's a different type of data source that we're looking at, um, with, whether it's cell phones, um, if you're looking at transportation, so all of us are familiar with things like Google Map, um, they actually are running simulations behind that in addition to doing data analysis because it's not good enough to just say there's a slowdown here on Interstate 80. You're trying to say in, in 15 minutes what will this slowdown look like so you can actually uh, make predictions about what the traffic will do in, in close to real time. And um, so in this case, we have even more sort of dis diffuse kind of data sources. They may be sensors embedded in the environment um, or in uh, or cell phones or in things like the power grid. <coughs> 
So the conclusion of this was that many science challenges, um, and I use the word science broadly to include even applied areas, are at the boundary of theory exper and experimentation. And what that means is that large-scale data analysis techniques need to be able to be combined with large-scale simulations, and they're intimately intertwined. Um, within uh, the kind of the government level, when we talked about things like exascale computing, there's been a question about, well, what does that do for data? And the point is that in science, these things, you can't decouple them. So you really need to be able to analyze very large complex observational s sources, but also do simulations as well. So that's really, just to give you kind of a roadmap of what I'm going to talk about, that was just trying to give you a flavor of the kind of science problems that we see that are at this boundary of simulation and observation. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the data science challenges that come up in this, um, and then talk more about exascale, and then some of the exascale research challenges, which is where we'll get into the programming models. So. Um, I'll give you a, kind of a silly example. This was something I did a few years ago. Um, did Google image search to say, um, and I put a, an image of a neutrino graph, um, graphic in it, to say, well, could I get other interesting data out? And of course, I get out other graphs that look somewhat visually like the one that I got from the neutrino, but it has nothing to do with, most of them have nothing to do with the neutrinos. Now, I could improve this, we all know, in Google image search by putting the word neutrino in there, and I may, might get some other graphs that are a little bit more relevant to the science problem that I'm interested in. But the the point is that scientists have nothing like the kind of search facilities over scientific data that we have readily available if we're going to do shopping online, where you can put in a very specific thing, a size, a color, uh, you know, a, a, a particular article of clothing, and get out you know, all of the things that are nearby in the area, all the things you can buy online, used and, and um, new, and things like that. So we really need to develop the ability to do science searches over uh, scientific data and get us to the actual data, not just to some, for example, publication that contains some data. Um, so uh, the, uh, the so that was the picture, sorry, of the, um, of the neutrino graph, the, the silly Google search I did. Um, so what we want to do is automated search. Um, we also want to do, um, meta, we need to have metadata. And of course, that's one of the first things that people say as soon as you say that you want to find scientific data, they say, well, all the data needs to be labeled with metadata. And of course, that's absolutely true. You'll need to have some metadata associated with the scientific data. I think, though, um, while part of the problem is going to be solved with policies and standards and agreements within scientific communities to label their data, if we look to the commercial uh, world for kind of inspiration, we realize that much of the, the uh, metadata you get, the information is inferred, okay? So um, we don't, uh, uh, every piece of, every image of uh, clothing doesn't necessarily have all of the metadata associated about exactly where it can be purchased, but you can infer that from the website from which it comes. And the same thing is actually true with scientific data, or at least this is our hypothesis. You can tell where the data was produced. You may be able to associate it with a particular science group, and from that uh, determine something about the uh, the type of data that it is, and um, people will, will use this to search for data. Um, something like the materials project that I mentioned before, which is a massive high throughput simulation project that then produces data that you also want to search o over, I think what we see from that is a different model of how people use the high performance computing facilities. So that kind of old school model of how you use a high performance computing facility is you get an account, you write your own application, maybe you use some other application somebody has written, um, you log in, you, you put your job and your data all together, and you launch the job and it goes into a queue, and you come back so, you know, maybe a couple of hours later and look at the results. But that's really not, I think, the future. The future is you go to a website like the Materials Project, you say, I would like to look at an atomic structure, this, this a material that has the following atomic structure. Um, you push a button and it says, oh, that has already been simulated and it's in the following database and here's the results. Or I haven't simulated that before, but we'll go off and just submit the jobs for you so the search may take a little bit longer. So the point is a different model for how we think about accessing um, our, our high perform performance computing facilities as well as how we um, analyze the data. So one of the big problems that, of course, comes up in scientific data and, in, and actually any kind of, uh, kind of non-trivial non social data as well is filtering and denoising that data. And here I, I would like to talk about an inspiration from Deb Agarwal, who runs um, our data sciences and technologies department up at the lab. Um, she works with a number of groups that have uh, carbon flux data, and these are some pictures of the sensors that are out there. She said, well, one of the problems is you have to really do some manual curation of this data uh, because birds will 
will come and drop things on these sensors and that will cause a spike in the, um, in the data stream. So they have to kind of go and clean up the data stream, so to speak. They may also have to go and clean up the sensors later, but um, they have to go and clean up the data stream so they get uh, useful data. And I think this is interesting when you compare this to uh, the cosmic microwave background history in which the original uh, the, the original scientists, um, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, who discovered cosmic microwave background, which of course is a blueprint of the Big Bang, originally thought that it was caused by uh, pigeon droppings on their uh, radio telescope. And it took them actually a couple of times of cleaning it out and saying, okay, well now we're going to get some good data before they realized, oh, that is not noise, that is the signal. And so we have to be very careful in scientific data that we don't throw away the signal because we don't know exactly what we're looking for. Um, and so that, that uh, there are it's going to be complicated to try to denoise things and try to keep around enough data that we can actually go back and find the interesting science. Now one of the points I want to make is that although I've talked about some of the facilities and I'll say more about that, there are a lot of mathematical and other research challenges associated with them. We have a project up at the lab called uh, CAMERA, which is the Center for Advanced Mathematics for Energy Research um, Applications, which is really looking at the kind of, and is led by Jamie Sethian, who's both a faculty member here on campus and also up at the lab, um, and it's, it's really looking at the kind of mathematical problems that come from these uh, things like the advanced light source up at the lab, there's another uh, light source at SLAC and so on. There's a whole series of these around the country. And um, he, he started this a few years ago, and the, the basic point was people thought that, well, this scientific data that's coming from observations isn't that interesting. There are no interesting research in the com computing program. The Department of Energy, which funds the lab, their computing program was entirely focused on simulation. And the point that Jamie made um, through a series of pro uh, collaborations with some of the scientists that work on these beam lines at the different facilities is there are incredibly important and difficult mathematical problems associated associated with analyzing the data, which probably anybody that's really in that community also recognized, but maybe in some cases they didn't recognize that they might not even be a asking the right mathematical question or the best way of asking the mathematical question to get the answer. So what he put together was a uh, the circle of the different connections, and on the left-hand side you see the uh, mathematical uh, methods. What you see in the center are some of the different types of beam lines, and these are the connections between them. So the point is that by really understanding the commonality across these different facilities, um, you can then reuse the different mathematical methods um, across the facilities. He also works with a number of different specific facilities around uh, the, the world, actually, um, including the computing facilities, and these also show the connections um, between some, some businesses as well, and these show the connections there as well. So they're really interesting, and I, obviously I'm not going into the mathematics of it, but um, mathematical problems that come up. And of course, you can't really talk about data today without being asked about machine learning. And we also find that we, when you look across the scientific areas at the lab, there are many people that are using machine learning methods of various kinds. So what is you, somewhat unique, or at least what is kind of a, an important emphasis of machine learning on science, on basic science that may be somewhat different than the commercial world um, where you, you may, you're, where also we're using uh, these different kinds of machine learning methods, including deep learning. Well, one of them is the complexity of the data. And that one um, is because in science, you may be taking from data from multiple different, very disparate sources. So you may be combining, for example, image data. There are satellites going around, taking pictures of, say, agricultural areas, trying to figure out what is, what is in, happening in those areas. Biological samples, so you've, got sa you've got sensors embedded in the ground. You've got climate modeling data, and you're trying to put all of this together. So the complexity of the data is one thing that I think is especially important in scientific data. Um, interpretability is something that is also you know, a, a, a common theme of some of the work that goes on in machine learning, but as I said before, scientists would, will never be satisfied with the answer, these two things are related, or uh, these, th this is what the, the cause of this other thing is, without actually understanding why that happens. So I'm um, really being able to interpret why the results of your, say, deep learn neural network are producing a certain kind of result will be the next step for any kind of a scientist. And b developing machine learning methods that actually allow you to understand why those connections are made will be especially important. And then finally, because of the size of these data sets, um, really, and, and because of the opportunity to use the kind of high performance computers that we have um, throughout the, at the lab and throughout the lab complex, um, being able to do machine learning, other kinds of uh, data analysis methods at scale will be equally important. <coughs> 
So the, the kind of last piece of the data challenge I will show is just this notional graph I put together a few years ago. And I'll just point out that this is just a very simple exponential graph for with, with an exponent that's computed based on the history of growth of the data rates for these different fields. So the red line is detectors. Those are the things that are, for example, in the light sources. So we've looked at these light sources are getting much higher rates of uh, data acquisition, much uh, denser. Um, uh, detectors and so they're they're both accelerating in, in time and the, that is the rate at which you can you can get a say an image off of them and also the um, the uh, density of that so the data rates are growing exponentially at a rate that's much higher than Moore's law so the green line that is um, down there near the bottom is the traditional Moore's law curve um, which of course is also going to have problems in the future but this is the historical data where it was growing exponentially and um, then the sequencers uh, so things like bio, uh, genome sequencers which are notoriously growing also at a rate faster than Moore's Law as the, as the yellow line. And you may say, well, we don't really care about computing, which I don't really agree with. But let's say that you say, well, we don't, we don't care about computing. We only care about memory and data and storage. Well, if you look at the memory line, that's the blue line, which of course is uh, the memory speed increase, which is even worse than the um, than the uh, processor speed historically. And um, in fact, we're seeing real problems with the growth in memory speed as well. So what this means is when we look at particular science experiments that people wanted to do, and I was at a meeting earlier this week in Germany on the square kilometer array, and there was somebody else speaking in my session on that. Obviously, these are, um, da these are data rates. This is in the exabytes of data that are going to be produced by that kind of facility. Um, and similarly, for the uh, light sources, the, the telescopes, and so on. Okay, so, um, so, so that's to, to motivate that we really do need the, the most powerful computer systems uh, in order to use these kinds of, to analyze these kinds of data sets. Um, so what do I mean by exascale? So um, there's a project within the Department of Energy called the Exascale Computing Project, ECP for short, and the goal of the DOE ECP project is to build a computer system that is 50 times more capable um, on applications, so it's not just about peak flops, it's about application performance um, relative to 2015. So this, they specifically look at a couple of machines, one at Oak Ridge National Lab, the Titan supercomputer, and another one at L Livermore La National Lab. Um, Sequoia just kind of set a baseline and say, we want to build a machine. Those are about 20 petaflop machines. We would like, um, we, uh, we would like uh, at, on the LINPAC benchmark, we'd like something that's 50 times more capable. But it's not directed at the LINPAC benchmark. It's directed at what the actual applications, how they actually perform on, that, um, on those systems. And they actually have over 20 application projects that they're funding because because part of the goal of this project is to get the applications ready to run on these systems as well. And their current goal is to deliver at least one, possibly two of those systems in 2021. Um, with many applications. Now my personal kind of twist on this um, is that we want that performance, that 50x performance increase on applications to happen at all scales. So it's not just going to be about buying more racks of computers and stringing them together, um, we have to be able to get the technology to be denser, that is to get more, more computing within a single rack, within a single node, or, or whatever your, your favorite unit is. So we want a con continued growth in computing performance at constant energy, um, and also con con continued growth at constant cost. So these are kind of uh, a little bit looser notions in terms of exactly what the metrics are um, for them, but we, are, um, we still want to look at application performance and how it scales um, in the future with respect to cost, because that will really tell us what the science community is able to do. At some point, there is a fixed cost for the amount of computing that you can purchase. So just to point out that computing is energy constrained, this is also looking at, uh, and I should have updated it with the latest machine, but this is, oh, I think there's one of them up here. Um, this is the little star that's way off the graph. Um, so this is the number of megawatts that one of these supercomputers like today or in, in the recent history uses. Um, and the... Uh, um, just to give you an idea, I, I used to run the nurse facility up at the lab, the supercomputing facility, and I can tell you that the price of electricity is about a million dollars per megawatt. It's actually, we get a good deal from the state, so we pay substantially less than that. But our order of magnitude, you can say you pay a million dollars a megawatt. So the, the y-axis here, which should be labeled, is a megawatt. So this says, you know, for the, the, these machines, up, this machine up here, you're paying $12 million a year just for the power bill, okay? Um, now. At the, something like the nurse facility, we have 
we have thousands of users, we have hundreds of different science projects, so you can amortize that over all of those projects, but nevertheless, it's very expensive. And in 2008, when we installed the supercomputer, that's while I was nurse director, it was a three megawatt machine, and it was roughly one petaflop. So if we wanted something that was a thousand times faster, it would be um, a three gigawatt machine, okay? so. Um, now we would, and, and if we try to extrapolate just kind of nor, normal Moore's Law technology, we could get down to uh, 200 megawatts in 2018. And I can tell you we are not going to have an exascale machine uh, next year, and we certainly won't have one at 200 megawatts. Um, but we are trying to get that down to the a few tens, so, so the 10 to 20 megawatts um, in the next few years in order to make them a practical to actually run. Um, that, that yellow star up there is the uh, Tahane, and then the Taihu, Taihu Light, I think, is actually somewhat lower um, in terms of the actually, well, anyway, these are the two fastest machines in the world um, that are both in China. So the goal um, is, it, you can look at, to oversimplify it now, forgetting about the application's performance, although that's really what the overall goal of the project is, we want an exaflop in 20 megawatts. And this translates to, to 20 picojoules per operation, and that's really independent of the scale of the machine. Now, it turns out that the most important, the most expensive thing you do on a computer today is move data around. It's not actually computing the flops, it's moving the data from the DRAM into the processor chip, from the processors out through the interface um, into the network, for example, and um, all of the data movement is really what, what uh, takes energy. And this was a graph put together by John Shelf a number of years ago looking at the um, number of joules, picojoules associated with various operations. So this is, these are floating point operations both in 20, just uh, when it was when the graph was put together a few years ago um, and predicted out to 2018, um, and you can see that it's it's um, a little bit you know there's some improvement in there for the um, energy associated with the floating point operation. This is what happens when you're accessing data that's inside of on the chip. Um, this is what happens though when you as soon as you go off chip, and there's a slight increase as you go across the machine. But the real um, the real kind of uh, cliff is what happens when you uh, go off chip. And so the point of this is we really need to think about how we design algorithms to minimize energy use, which means how do we design algorithms that minimize the data movement? And so I'll talk a little bit about, um, about algorithms to do that. Note that these kinds of communication things, people will say, well, you just didn't put enough money into the network. And I can tell you that, um, first of all, you can't change latency because it's related to physics. Um, and secondly, you can try to change bandwidth, but you are, are already putting a fair amount of money into the network. And it turns out that um, the, the amount that you could put in to try to get the machine more balanced um, is going to just cause you to put in less computing and um, you can't really ever ever um, pay for a machine even if you paid may put 90% of your your money into the network and only 10% into the computing you wouldn't find that um, is really worth it for the overall application performance so what we're seeing is that bandwidth um, is really about money latency is about physics and for that reason we're going to come up with algorithms that rather than counting floating point operations which is traditionally what we teach all of our freshmen here at Berkeley we teach them about algorithms or maybe when they're sophomores but anyway we teach them to count the number of arithmetic or logical operations and all their algorithms, what we should be doing is to keep teaching them about the number of uh, data movement operations in those algorithms. Okay, so um, what are some of the exascale challenges that, that come up when you try to use these ex future exascale systems for data problems? I'll start by talking about the about programming models, um, and this is related to some work I've done over the last decade or more, actually almost two decades now, looking at um, a class of, la of languages called partition global address-based languages, which allow you to directly read and write memory across the machine without having a paired send and receive, even on a large-scale cluster. So. What do we see, though, um, in terms of the difference between the data applications and simulation problems? Well, actually, back when I was nurse director, I heard two different things. The first thing I heard was, oh, the data problems are so boring in terms of the algorithms that they don't deserve to run on supercomputers. Um, and the, the example that people would, would point to is Large Hadron Collider, where you're actually looking at a number of different events, and those are, can be analyzed separately. And indeed, the way the LHC data analysis goes is it's spread all over the world with different uh, tier one and tier two facilities in which the data can be analyzed. Okay? Now that's not to say, by the way, that there aren't interesting mathematical questions and other questions in LHC data analysis, but those are basically independent jobs. For, so from a parallelism standpoint, it's, um, it's trivial to parallelize them. On the other end of the spectrum, but also a data analysis problem, is one that I'll say a little bit more about, which is genome analysis. Um, in particular, an application we've been working on, uh, which is genome assembly, 
quickly, it turns out that the way the sequencers read the genome is they read a fragment of it, say 100 or 200 base pairs um, out of that, and if you want to actually reconstruct the chromosomes, you need to do this by um, gluing these different pieces together. So it's kind of like putting together um, a puzzle um, from uh, different pieces. By the way, the sequencers also throw in errors just to make things more interesting, um, and it turns into a fairly, a very complicated data analysis problem. Now for the human genome, because the work done many years ago, there is a standard reference and people, it's like having the cover of your, your um, puzzle that you can look at and you can say, oh, this piece looks like it probably goes at this part of the, uh, the uh, puzzle and that helps you in putting it together. But for most of the genomes that we care about in the environment, for example, they're first of all, they're, they're, um, you don't have any reference and so you don't have the, you don't have the cover of the, the, uh, of the genome that you're trying to put together, um, so you need to put, reconstruct the puzzle with just from the pieces and don't forget that there are errors thrown in. The other thing that complicates the environmental genome case is that though they don't tend to be species in isolation. You may have, if you scoop up some soil um, and you, you sequence what's inside of that, you may have thousands or even millions of separate species inside of that. So now imagine you're putting a puzzle together where somebody has taken a thousand different puzzles, thrown all the pieces together, and now you're trying to construct all thousand puzzles. So these are very challenging problems. Um, we use it using this idea of these partition global uh, address space um, programming models. So just very briefly, um, if you're not familiar with them, a global address space means that you can um, directly read and write into data structures across the machine. So for example, if you have a global pointer um, in a language like UPC, you can, um, you can put that in a, either, on, you can dereference it either on the left-hand side or the right-hand side that will generate a message that goes out into the network and then access it is the memory on the other side. The, um, and the, uh, you can also have distributed arrays and directly read and write into those as well. Um, it's partitioned because it's very important, given that some of these things, these dereferences, these pointer uh, dereferences, for example, will generate messages and some of them will just generate local memory traffic that you keep track in your application of what things are nearby and what things are far, far away. So even though you can directly read and write anything you want across the machine, you shouldn't be doing that all the time. If you have some locality in your application, you should take advantage of it. And so you get to partition up your arrays in a way that makes them um, faster to access. Um, so it is actually the case that these, these PGAS languages are using a communication mechanism that's closer to what happens in hardware, namely an RDMA, remote data, data um, access, uh, memory data, data access mechanism. So if you have a message that is uh, a, a read or write that's going across the network, it goes in a network interface and any of the modern network interfaces um, will directly read or write that from memory rather than bothering the host CPU on the other side. On the other hand, if you're using a, a model like MPI that leads the traditional send and receive model in MPI, um, you have a message ID and the information about where this data payload goes actually is coming from the application on the host CPU on the other side. So that matching send and receive at some point has to happen. It may happen somewhat asynchronously, but the point is that the information about where this data should be written in memory does not exist in the, in the message. It exists in a receive operation that is, is in a separate program on the other side, or at least a separate part of the uh, program. Okay, and we see that as um, what we're, we're going to see in order to address that that energy problem I told you about for exascale is we're going to have a larger number of slower processors, so simpler, slower processors. And so this is looking at the software overhead that you get from something like a send and receive model on, say, a current x86 machine and then project it out into what would happen on a, a slower, a one gigahertz x86 machine, whoops, and, um, and then onto a, a, a three-way SIMT um, model where you've got a one, one gigahertz machine. The point is that the cost of that, that, um, that overhead, the send and receive overhead of just running the software stack to do those operations is going to be increasing relative to the cost of computation because the processors are not getting faster. So you don't want a, a system with, say, a, a thousand cores on a node and have every one of those running the MPI software stack. What you'd like to do is directly access hardware mechanisms such as the put and get facilities that are in the hardware um, whenever you can. We use this in a number of different applications. Um, this, this comes up in adaptive mesh refinement. I think in the interest of time, I won't go into details, but this just shows that there are some speed ups that you get by using this kind of one-sided access in a number of these um, simulations that have relatively, I would say, modest size app, um, messages that are being sent because they're, they involve adaptive, mes me uh, adaptive meshes. 
Another example, and this was a um, former student, Scott French, who worked with Barbara Romano, it's one of the faculty members on the campus in Earth and Planetary Sciences, um, looked at a whole mantle, uh, building a whole mantle seismic model. Um, he had an application of simulation code. It was written in MPI. It was mostly written in Fortran, I believe. It did a lot of calls to LAPAC and Scalapack and things like that. Um, but there was one problem in which um, he needed to take observational data from seismic centers. What they're trying to do is they're trying to infer what the structure of the mantle of the Earth is by looking at these signals that come from um, seismograph from, say, small and larger er, um, earthquake events. And so the problem was that in trying to do that, there was this large matrix assembly that was, uh, that was kind of unstructured. The data wasn't necessarily lined up with the processor that owned that piece of the matrix. And, um, and so in order to, to make it possible to assemble this for a a matrix that was larger than would fit on a single node. Um, he used that for a PGAS and a PGAS implementation using a, a prototype version of a language called UPC++ um, and then was able to solve a problem that they hadn't been able to solve before in terms of the size of the data um, that they're able to analyze. And they made scientific discoveries in terms of where these um, the, the uh, vol volcanic islands, for example, the Hawaiian islands, and so that they're really tied to these, um, these plumes within the, um, within the Earth's mantle. So um, that's, this, this is an example of where you're trying to fuse observational data with simulation. Um, this is a little bit of the uh, performance graph that shows that there's a strong scaling on one of the NERSC supercomputers, and this is kind of a notional graph of what you're trying to do. So you've got a big distributed matrix and then do the assembly. Now here's the genome problem that I talked about before. Um, as I said, you're, you're starting with these, these um, strings of bases. Um, they have errors in them. They're fairly short fragments, and we're trying to put them together without um, a reference. So how do we do this in a, in a partition global address space language? Well, um, the, the, if you talk to the, the most of the bio, biology community, the, the assemblers that they're using in production today, um, including metagenome assemblers, which are used for these large, complex, um, multi-species environmental data sets, are written in shared memory. And um, so the, and they, they kind of feel like they have to have shared memory. In fact, we were just talking with a group from the Joint Genome Institute about whether they should go buy another set of Ter one terabyte or byte or two terabyte shared memory machines, which of course are fairly expensive, um, in order to do the analysis. And instead what we did is we took the, these algorithms and mapped them onto distributed memory using this idea of being able to do one-sided access. And without going into details, I'll just say that, um, so you can use this global address space idea um, instead, the data structure, which may be hard to interpret here, is just a hash table. Um, and so it turns out what you do is you break the, the genome sequences into even smaller fixed length pieces, you hash all of them, the hash table is too large to fit in most shared memory machines, at least for some of these large data sets, um, and so that's why you just spread it out. So you're doing something that's fairly expensive, which is you want to insert something into a hash table. The bucket of that hash table, if you're running on, say, 1,000 processors, has a chance of you know, 999 over 1,000 that's going to be remote, but you just go ahead and do that. And, when, and it turns out that um, it scales actually very well up to um, tens of thousands of processors. Um, and we can do even a de novo assembly of the human genome. So if you want to assemble a human genome without a reference, you can actually do that in about four, mi four minutes on, um, uh, well, it says 10 minutes here. I think we've gotten it down even uh, closer to four minutes now on about 20,000 cores. Um, okay, so there's lots of distributed hash tables that come up, and this is one of the places that we need higher level languages. So unfortunately, the biologists that we're collaborating with, although they really want to use this high performance version, they also want to continue innovating in the algorithms. They don't necessarily want to, to uh, write at the level of UPC, this uh, global address based language, not because of the global address space, I think, so much as they just want to be able to hide the complexity of how do you deal with linked lists and hash tables and race conditions and all of that kind of stuff across distributed memory. So we would like to be able to build a library of distributed hash tables that allow them to do the different kinds of operations they need to do for genome analysis and put them together in different ways. But right now, um, there's kind of a low-level way in which we're getting scalable high performance and a high-level way in which they'd like to think about this. By the way, the original code they were using in production, which was partly written in Perl, it was partly parallelized and not, um, is, bu is about 700 times slower than the, the code that um, we have given them. So they can actually use it in very different ways. They can solve different problems that they than they could before. Um, there are different ways in which these hash tables get, get optimized in different parts of the application. There's just a simple scaling graph. Okay. So um, a little bit about algorithms. I mentioned before that we really need to think about um, moving data around rather than the cost of computation. 
Um, this is some work done by um, Edgar Solomonic, who was a grad student at the time. Uh, there it is. And, um, and Jim Demmel, his advisor. So this was done in uh, 2011. And uh, what we're showing here is dense matrix matrix multiplication um, running on a large number of, of cores. This is 16,000 cores of a blue gene P, uh, P system using the traditional domain decomposition approach. That is, you divide up the C matrix, the result matrix, into blocks, and each processor is responsible for computing the results in that block. And that is the, um, the execution time. That's called the 2D algorithm because there's the two-dimensional partitioning of the computation space, um, and that's the higher um, the bar that's at one. Um, they have a, what, what they call a 2.5D algorithm that runs a, much faster, it is the lower level bar here, that's a 95% reduction in communication time and um, a significant speed up overall as well. So I, this wasn't work that I directly um, worked on, but I was really interested in it from a couple of perspectives. One is I'm more of a compiler person, and um, first of all, I was surprised that matrix multiply, which by the way, we've been working on for decades, um, still had some room for improvement. Um, there are ideas, this algorithm, this 2.5D algorithm, there's also a version of it called the 3D algorithm. So that's kind of the, the same thing um, if you squint in a certain way. Um, and, and some of these kinds of algorithms were actually used on early, um, uh, say, SIMD, uh, multi, uh, SIMD supercomputers, so things like the MassPAR or the connection machine. Um, but, but still, of, relative to the, the algorithms that we're really using today, there was still some room for improvement, which surprised me for dense matrix multiply because we've put a lot of work into optimizing that over the years. The basic idea was to make copies of the result matrix on a subset of uh, on different groups of processors and have them independently compute parts of the C matrix or kind of pieces of the updates that are, that are, that are done on the C matrix and then do a reduction at the end to add those C matrices together. Um, it turns out also that you can prove that this is optimal in communication, whereas the previous algorithm is not. So it's both uh, experimentally interesting but also theoretically interesting. The lesson, kind of a high level lesson from this is if you've got, you, you're making copies of this matrix, so you are going to use more memory than you do in the original algorithm, in the 2D algorithm. Um, but uh, if you have extra memory, you should not waste it. You should use it because more fast memory um, can be used to sometimes reduce the amount of communication. So um, if you look at 3D ma matrix multiply um, from a, sorry, if you look at matrix multiply from the iteration space, you've got the perspective, you've got these three nested loops, um, and we can kind of look at it graphically in the, in the following way. The question is, if I'm trying to figure out what is a communicational optimal algorithm, the way to think about that is what piece of the interior region of that cube, that is all the computation that has to be done, one point in there for every one of the iterations of those three loops, um, what, what chunk of that should I pick up that minimizes the projection projection of that, that blob on the three surfaces for the A matrix, the B matrix, and the C matrix. So I can ask, is there a better shape? Um, and it turns out, not surprisingly, the best shape is some kind of a cubic shape, not necessarily, um, not necessarily a perfect cube, but um, that, that a cube is going to be an optimal shape. And um, you kind of, ooh, crash PowerPoint, which is not um, a good thing to do. Um, but uh, it turns out that you can apply this to other algorithms besides matrix multiply. And um, you can do it by, um, uh, for example, on a simple, naive n-body algorithm that's just doing an n-squared uh, way computation comparison or, or calculating all forces between all pairs of n particles. It's more complicated to do it on a tree-based code, but these ideas of being able to um, minimize communication come up there. It also comes up in, um, say a sparse dense matrix multiply, which is the kernel that you use in, a, um, in computing graphical models and a particular machine learning algorithm. So this is some work done by one of my students and another, uh, and Sang Oh, who's a machine learning person at uh, UC Santa Barbara and others. So um, let me just say a little bit more about the algorithmic space. Um, there are, if you, there's a nice report by the National um, Research Council, the National Academies put together on what are the seven kind of kernels of big data analysis. Um, they call them the seven giants. This is because in the simulation community we used to refer to the seven uh, sort of little, little kernels as the seven dwarfs of simulation. Um, but uh, there, what surprises me is there's actually a lot of commonality. Linear algebra comes up all over the place. And just to kind of put this, um, emphasize this point a little bit more, um, this is a graphic put together by Aiden Bulich and a number of others who's also a lab scientist on um, a number of different classes of machine learning methods and the linear algebra kernels that they use and they're ordered by sort of the most irregular on the left and the most regular and computationally intensive on the right so we get to dense blas 3 over here we have sparse matrix sparse vector on the other end um, all of these different kernels are important um, in looking at machine learning so this is not to say that machine learning algorithms are all going to look exactly like simulation 
and algorithms. The biggest difference, I think, is the, the, the sparsity structure of the sparse matrices, because of course sparse matrices also come up in simulations. Um, but the point is that there's still a lot of common knowledge uh, that we can use across the different systems. Um, so I'll just say a little bit about the systems for data. Um, of course, Spark is a, a model that's been popular in data an analysis. What's interesting to me is that was designed with a particular mindset about how a system behaves. That is a high failure rate, a slow network, and fast local disk. Okay, so what do you do? Well, you make copies of things and you store them all the time to disk because you're assuming there's a high failure rate. As a result, you end up with, even in Spark, which is, a which is a, at least a, an order of magnitude faster than Hadoop, you end up with something that's still an order of magnitude slower than, say, MPI. And it all comes from this mindset that says there's such a high failure rate, we need to store things out to disk. Um, you can you know, maybe make it faster with the SSD, but you can also just change the model and not necessarily change things so quickly. We also have to have our HPC facilities be able to take data streams that are arriving in real time from things like telescopes. This is something that's been prototyped at NERSC for a number of different science projects, um, and they have managed to set up these real-time queues for those applications. Um, containers are very popular for some of these data, uh, these, um, these, uh, data pipelines, um, so obviously I'm just going to go through these quickly in the interest of time, but one of the problems we had is that the container software didn't run on the HPC system, so another group at NERSC took Docker platform and um, ported it to run and, and in collaboration with Cray on the Cray HPC, the supercomputers, um, and then we can run containerized software on the Cray systems as well. Now, I don't want to lose the opportunity to talk about how I think uh, Julia fits into this and um, what we are seeing going back to kind of that original model of how people interface with the supercomputers for both data analysis and for simulation is to come in through web interfaces using something like Jupyter, which I know you heard uh, Fernando talk about yesterday, the day before. and. Um, um, and so I think you know, what you want is to p give the, the um, people high-level tools such as Julia for doing that kind of analysis. So um, why do you want high-level languages like Julia? Well, there's really five things. Um, first of all, data scientists, at least at the moment, are less tolerant of low-level programming models than the simulation community is. So there's a real opportunity here to actually give them higher-level programming. Secondly, if you want to do the things like communication-avoiding algorithms and put them in a compiler, you need a compiler that can actually analyze the code. And if you write it all in C and C++, Plus plus, I can tell you it becomes very difficult to do anything that's non-localized um, that gets more complicated like that. Um, you want to be able to, to encapsulate complex data structures, so data analysis is not all about multidimensional arrays. You certainly want sparse arrays. You also want graphs and hash tables and things like that, and you want to encapsulate them in a high-level way. And you want a high-level way of access doing a global address space because, as I at least tried to argue, I think for some of these data analysis problems that are highly irregular, you do need to be able to, say, go, go and grab a little bit of a state that's across the machine because you have a graph that's mapped over the machine. And finally, independent of whether you're talking about data analysis or simulation, the machines are getting wackier all the time. What do I mean by that? Well, we're going to see more and more specialized um, architectures, and I think the first place, that, and we're seeing that just because Moore's Law is running out, all the kind of performance aspects related to that um, are running out, but it, and, um, and we're going to see more specialized architectures, whether it's FPGAs, um, so reconfigurable, or real, say, um, ASICs that are specialized. We're going to see processing happening more in the detectors, um, and so I think what we'll see is special purpose architectures closer to the data sources first, um, but I think they'll also be making their way into the HPC facilities. And finally, just kind of a little, a little comment about um, the policies that we use for, for the um, HPC facilities. We, it, it, we actually make it fairly difficult for people to use supercomputing facilities. They, they tend to be free um, within the DOE and the NSF system to anybody who's in the club, but if you're not in the club, you can't really use those, those systems. So if you contrast this, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong slide here. If you contrast this with, um, and you also, in some of the facilities, by the way, only take jobs at a certain scale. So if you're not tall enough, you don't get to ride on the supercomputer. Um, and I think we need to make these kinds of systems more available. Um, if you contrast that with, say, the cloud, the commercial cloud, where um, anybody with a credit card or their parents' credit card can go and uh, get some computing on the, uh, on the cloud, I think we need a model that allows you know, both of these things. And really, to me, cloud is not about what technology is in there, it's really about um, the business model for how you pay for it. And with that, I will end, um, and I'm happy to take a question or two if there's time, just uh, acknowledge all of the collaborators I've worked with over the years. Thanks very much.